Welcome to Wave 102 Lesson 8. Today, Denise is going to talk about God's pattern for helping, and we're going to finish up the section on how to answer your own questions in Bible study. Here's Denise. In the last days of his ministry on earth, Jesus gave an object lesson that was going to show how God was going to provide help. Let me le uh, read the account of that object lesson in Mark 14, 22. And as they did eat, Jesus took bread and blessed and break it and gave it to them and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Now you will probably recognize this as the Last Supper. And they were together and Jesus was showing them sort of the pattern for the way God was going to work through his life and their life and our life. So number three, Jesus took the bread. He blessed the bread. He broke the bread and then he gave the bread. Now, this is also the pattern for the way God worked with Jesus's life because God took Jesus. He blessed Jesus. He broke Jesus. And then he gave Jesus. You know, God provided help for us when he broke Jesus by placing our sin upon him. You know, then he gave Jesus over to receive the punishment that we deserved for our sin. But this is also the pattern, the way that God works in our life. Look at number five. God takes us. He blesses us. He breaks us, and then He gives us. Now, we all love the taking part and the blessing part, you know, but we all cry foul, you know, when we get to the breaking part. You know, we say, this isn't what I signed up for. But he that loves his life will lose it. This next passage in John 12, 24 to 28, sort of describes the breaking process. I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. The man who loves his life will lose it, while the man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am my servant will also be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. Now my heart is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. Now if we are not willing to be broken, you know, like the kernel of wheat, in other words, being willing to die to our own agenda. You know, if, we're, if we just say, no, it's my life. I want what I want, you know, we won't be able to do that because we're too busy, you know, clutching at it. Now, Jesus was not crazy about the breaking process either. You know, he said, my heart is troubled. He was stressed by this, but he was willing to do it. He was willing to go through. You know, it reminds me, years ago, I remember while I was watching the movie Horse Whisperer. I don't know if you remember that movie, but if you didn't see it, it was about a young girl who was riding her horse and they were hit by a truck. And in the scene that I was struck by, they, it's after the accident and the veterinarian and the different ones that care about the horse are trying to approach the horse, but the horse is scared and hurt, and it keeps rearing up and bucking and rearing up and bucking, and they're trying to figure out how we're going to help this horse. You know, we can't, he keeps fighting, we can't get near him. And I remember thinking to myself, oh Lord, I think I'm like that horse. You know, I was going through something difficult, I was scared, I was hurt, and I know in my heart I was rearing up and bucking, and I was fighting the situation, but I realized, you know, I can't get the help I need if I keep fighting this. 
And so when you are struggling and when you are fighting and you know that you're bucking around in your heart, the thing to do to get help is to stop fighting. You know, to accept, okay, this is a difficult situation. This is my assignment right now. And when you stop fighting and accept it, then you can walk toward the help. And sometimes the help is just confiding in a trusted friend. And sometimes it's talking to a pastor or a professional. But it always includes walking toward God for the help that He so often and wonderfully provides. He wants to be there. So if you find yourself in a difficult situation, stop fighting. Walk toward the help. God wants to help you. Blessings on you. Last time we gave you the steps for answering your questions in Bible study. There are five steps. Let me review them. The first step is to pray for wisdom. The second step is to list out all the possible answers you can think of. The third step is to write out the support that you can think of for each of the possible answers. The fourth step is to choose the best answer based on the support. And the last step is to check an authority, add the information you get from the authority to your list, then look at the entire list and make your final decision. That's how you can answer your questions that come up to you when you're studying the Bible. A question we often get about answering your questions, people are worried about uh, slipping into heresy. Are are they um, going down a bad path? I wish I could convey to you what that, the true answer to that. Uh, Let me try my best. If you're concerned about making sure you're staying in a good doctrine in your answer, you are. Um, Heresy happens when, when people have an internal need, a psychological or other need, for um, a certain uh, truth, a certain idea. And the Bible is written so that you can, um, you can force an idea into many different parts of the Bible. It's not written airtight. This, in the last analysis, is a walk by faith. And that's what's important to God. And for that reason, faith is involved. So, uh, but, but let me come back to the question of uh, how do I know I'm going in the right direction? How do I know it, uh, I'm not, you know, being a heretic? Um, let me address that. Oh, no, oh, and other people think they need to be really smart to answer their question. This is true. People come up to us all the time saying, you know, I just don't think I'm smart enough to answer my question. Um, let me tell you about a... Um, prophecy speaker, a professional speaker that went around talking about end-time events. He would give seminars at churches, week-long seminars. In this one town he stopped in, he was giving a seminar at a church there, and during the week he had made an appointment to uh, meet with one of the church members at a local high school. He was on the high school campus walking through the halls, and he happened by an open door and it was the gymnasium in there, but something caught his eye as he walked by. So he stopped and turned and walked over to the doorway and looked in, and there was nobody in this gym, all, all over across the gym except on the very far end of it, there was one man sitting down, and it looked like he was reading a Bible. This intrigued the prophecy speaker. So he walked over to where this man was and sat down quietly and happened to notice This man was reading the book of Revelation, and he was a janitor. He he was a very simple, simple man. Uh, Well, this prophecy speaker was really intrigued with him reading this uh, book about complex events. And he said, uh, 
uh, is that the book of Revelation you're reading? He says, why, yes, sir, it is. He said, do you understand what you're reading? He says, yes, sir, I think so. So the speaker said, well, well, tell me, um, uh, what does the book of Revelation mean? And the man thought for a moment and he said, in the end, God wins. And that's true. And that's so very true. And it's the most important point of the book of Revelation. And sometimes people that are very bright get focused on a lot of little details and they miss the forest. So um, it is very possible. When Jesus uh, was talking about understanding the things of the kingdom of God, he, he brought a child close to him and he said, this is the example, you need to think simply. So don't worry about how smart you are. Just worry about your focus. Read the Bible and focus on what you understand and use it to grow closer to God. There's another story I want to tell you on the same theme of answering your questions. This is a story about a pottery class in a, a local junior college. In this class, they did an experiment. They, they divided the class in two groups at the beginning of class, the first day of the semester, and told the group on this side, for, for you people, we're gonna grade you solely on the basis of the quality of what you produce. We don't care if you just produce one pot the entire semester, all we grade on is quality for this group. This other group, uh, we're going to grade you on the number of things you produce. So it doesn't matter if it's slapped down anything, if you, we just count how many things you produce and we're going to uh, compare the two groups at the end of the semester. So the semester went along and at the end of the semester, they uh, kept their promise and uh, signed grades the way they said they would. Then they looked at the pots and um, they compared them for quality, how good the pot was. And one group was focused just on quality, one group was focused just on the number of pots, quantity of pots. Which group do you think produced the highest quality pot? It's not what it seems like. It's not the group that was graded on the quality. It's the group that was graded on how many they produced. You see, practice makes perfect. The more you do it, the better you get at it. And the more you grow in the Christian life, the more things that were questions become irrelevant to you. So it's a process of growing and you will, you will come across the answers and you will get more precise understanding even when you're not focusing on questions. Now, like I say, there are some times you need to focus on them and these five rules, five steps will help you greatly. But whenever possible, don't focus on them. I mean, it's kind of like if you're a cow and you walk out into a green, lush pasture with lots of food for this cow, wonderful. But over in the far corner, there's this patch of brown where the grass doesn't grow. Now, would it make any sense for you to trot over to that section of brown dirt and try and feed from that and, you know, scratch it up and try and find a little bit of grass to eat? when there's this whole field of lush food. It's like that in studying the Bible. There are so many things that do make sense. If possible, focus on that and you'll grow faster and better. Next time, Denise is gonna talk about Jesus' statement, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And we're gonna go over example eight of four-step Bible study. Until then, Lord bless you.